And Dave Rothery is going to talk next is one of the prime, the best examples. Depending on what day it is, Dave can be a volcanologist or a planetary scientist. Today he's going to be a planetary scientist. Tomorrow he's going to be a volcanologist. Tomorrow I'm going to be a media star. <laughs> <laughs> Showing what's on my screen. It is now. Um, yes, sir, I, I arrived as a student of, of Ian Gass. I'm one of the people who's still here, who's had a foothold in each of the four decades. Maybe that's why I'm on the podium now, I'm not sure. And as you do, I was editing my talk only an hour ago because I thought, let's start with a picture of Ian Gass, set this department going, and it was my supervising so on. I didn't have a picture of Ian in digital form, so I went on to Google Images and I put in Ian Gass in quotes marks and I got thousands and thousands of hits, none seemed to be a picture of Ian Gass. So I thought, let's narrow the search down, so I added the word ophelites in. And, uh, and this is what I got, Ian Gass ophelites. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's me on the, my cap, from the Capsar website, so I, I thought, well, there must be one of Ian somewhere, so I scrolled down to page two. <laughs> Still no picture of Ian. I didn't recognise this guy, but that's Gavin Graham, who was a PhD student two years ahead of me, worked in the own lab. So anyway, I haven't got a picture of Ian for you, because I got bored going down through all this. But now Ian started me off. So I was doing remote sensing in the own man over there. Ian's way of getting money was to say, oh, this Landsat is a good wheeze, let's get some money for that. And that's, that's what started me up. And I'm ever so grateful because it took me into remote sensing, into monitoring volcanoes, and into uh, planetary work, because remote sensing of the Earth is not much different to remote sensing of planetary surfaces, and I'd always been interested in planets. So I had, a, as some alluded to, a, a mixed career to a, a doing various things and teaching a wide variety of things, which is one of the beauties of the OU uh, as well. I now find myself in the position of UK lead scientist on the only UK instrument um, that's flying to Mercury on, on Becky Colombo. That's ESA's mission to Mercury, which is launching in 2014. We'll get there in 2020. So it will take me through to uh, retirement. Of course, I won't be able to kick me out by then because of law changing. So this, this involves me in meetings with the principal investigator of the Leicester, because this instrument is designed and masterminded at Leicester, I'm just the lead scientist, not the PI, and in various uh, Easter meetings and so on. And now I'm in planets, it gets me onto Scott Knight with dear old Sir Patrick as well. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting field to be in, and Mercury is a particularly interesting planet. Um, so here's our mission, uh, ESA, JAXA. JAXA is the Japanese space agency, so it's a joint mission with two spacecraft that are travelling to Mercury bolted together. That's the Japanese magnetospheric orbiter, and this is the, the, this is the uh, European um, planetary orbiter. So they both orbit the planet, but one concentrates on the magnetosphere, one on the planet. Um, the awkward thing is because it's two spacecraft bolted together, and although we fly by Mercury two or three times on the way there, until we achieve orbit and separate, we can't start doing any science. That's in contrast to the NASA mission Messenger, which has had three flybys already and brought wonderful science back to us already. And I'll largely be talking about Messenger information today, because that's the only data we have to hand yet. Uh, it launched from Earth, and it flew past Mercury three times by having an orbit that was twice, the, twice Mercury's orbit period. So it flew, flew past Mercury at the same point in its orbit three times. Suggested by this chap, Giuseppe Colombo, um, an Italian celestial engineer, and his name, Beppe Colombo, is what the Europeans took to give to the European mission. So that's why we have our strangely named mission, Beppe Colombo, because this guy was the first to point out about slingshot effects and getting orbits and able to visit one planet several times. So here is what we knew of Mercury from Mariner 10. Um, we got Mercury's density very quite well constrained because of the deflection of Mariner 10 as it flew by. We knew it had to have a very large core. We knew about its magnetic field, which indicated that the core was fluid, at least part of it. Um, surface with lots of impact craters. On the left of this view here is a Caloris Basin, a very big multi-ringed impact basin. Uh, seen in low angle sun here, see the fractures on the surface. But that surface we now know is, uh, is volcanic infill, which considerably post-dates the formation of the basin. Here's the outermost of this ring of Caloris. One other um, thing I want to focus on that came out of Mariner 10 
with features like this one here in the insert. The sun is shining from left to right. This shadowed feature is not a cliff, but it's a scarp facing down to the right. That's compressional tectonics. That's a thrust fault cutting towards the surface. Um, you, this crater here is cut by the by the scarp. You don't really see the crater being foreshortened because the actual amount of shortening on these features is the order of a couple of kilometres. So it's not a lot, but everybody agreed after Messenger, after Mariner 10, it's still true that these are crustal shortening features. Mercury's undergone an episode of, of contraction because probably to do with cooling down, the planetary radius has decreased by the order of a kilometre giving you this era of thrust faulting on the surface. Here's a, a closer up uh, view of that feature which is named Discovery Rupees. Rupees is Latin for scarp. And all the names of these scarps are taken from ships or expeditions that discovered things on the Earth. So Discovery was one of Captain Cook's ships. And you may see some evidence of the sense of east to west displacement on this closer up view of the shortening across that crater there. So that was Discovery Rupees. So an era of, of contraction. It may be due to the, uh, the core cooling down, it may be phase change in the mantle. Anyway, an era of contraction, relatively late in the planet's history, because these low base scarps cut most of the craters, but not all of them. I mean, from all the data we now have, here's the Caloris Basin over here. And just one example, not from flyby one, but from a later flyby, magnifying this area here. There's a young basin here, and the crater age inside this basin, the crater statistic counting age, is less than, or it's about, sort of a billion years. It's much younger than elsewhere, most of the places on the planet. But here, this uh, yellow region here, which you can see in the global view, surrounding these non-circular holes in the ground, which are therefore not impact craters, but probably volcanic vents, this yellow stuff is reckoned to be a pyroclastic deposit, there's a yellow patch here, which is probably also pyroclastic, explosive volcanic products from some vents which are too small to see yet, but hopefully we'll spot them when either Messenger or Betty Colombo gets into orbit. So young pyroclastic deposits and young um, basin filling deposits. That's the Rachmaninoff Basin. Here's a closer up view of Rachmaninoff. And you see in this interior region here, relatively few craters, so a young age. Here's the Caloris Basin and uh, the, the, the yellow ring was its estimated size on Mariner 10. The blue ring is how big we now know it is. And in the middle, it's got a radiating pattern of fractures breaking up this volcanic floor. There's a debate going on as to whether this uh, impact crater here is just a fortunate bullseye that hit the middle of the pattern or whether the crater caused this radial fracture pattern. But I think these radial fractures are not all the same age. You see some cross-cutting relations here. No time to dwell on that. Around the edge of the basin, um, we have fractures which are concentric to the basin. So there's a whole history of this basin being excavated, rebounding isostatically, being partially filled by volcanic material, being weighed down and sinking again. And the people who model this kind of thing can model the fractures forming in different ways in different parts of the basin. And three or four similar basins, not as big as Caloris, have been studied on Mercury. And they've all got a fracture pattern, but they've all got a different fracture pattern. Um, so there's a lot of work yet to be done on unraveling just how these basins uh, behave. I want to show you some volcanic evidence on the rim of Caloris Basin. We're inside the basin here. That's a young ejector crater with bright ejector around it. That's bog standard stuff. That's on the moon too. Ejector is pale and darkens with age. This crater here has some very queer pale stuff on the floor. Uh, which post-dates the crater formation, but we don't understand it. Is it some volatile stuff exhaling from the regolith and condensing? Is it some kind of high albedo lava flow? We don't know. Go south across the rim of Caloris, sort of on the rim, there's this bent structure here. This is probably a volcano. There was now some very limited topographic evidence which does suggest this is high and the height drops off all around it. And the rim of this crater here is almost buried by the volcanic material here and possibly some subsidiary vents there, and there are other vent structures recognised elsewhere on Mercury. Now, if you don't believe this is a vent, then fair enough, it's not entirely convincing. This is a better volcanic vent than you'll see on the Moon. Mantle. One way you can do that is to form it with a more Earth-like ratio of core to silicate material. 
then the last giant impact in the process blasts away a large part of the outer bit of the planet, which somehow does not reaccrete onto the planet, so you leave it with a, a, a relatively thin magma ocean out from which you form your crust. And one of the big issues is, what is Mercury's oldest crust? There's no very ancient looking crust on Mercury here. Um, we can't see any crust that looks like it's four and a half billion years old. I'm working to try and, I think the, the primary crust on Mercury did not form like the primary crust on the Moon. It's not a flotation crust. There are various models for how it might have formed. But until we can identify the oldest crust on Mercury and some younger crust and get their compositions, we're not going to have, understand the geochemical evolution of Mercury very well, unless we find a meteorite from Mercury. But yes, it could well have lost its crust, but, and a large part of its mantle as well, to explain its relatively small proportion of silicates. There are other explanations as well, and the jury's still out on it. 